Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar for sixth to 12th grade teachers in our 2021-2022 webinar series, focusing on building student visual literacy skills. I'm Rebecca Edwards, and I'll be your host today. I'll be presenting together with my colleague in the Getty Museum Education Department, Darcy Beeman Black. Today, we'll be focusing on strategies that you can use in the middle and high school classroom for researching art. We'll share how these approaches integrate with the Common Core Standards and talk about how you can use them to guide students in doing some detective work. We also hope to inspire you to incorporate works of art into your teaching across subject areas. For our examples today, we'll be using works of art in the Getty Museum's collection, but our goal is for you to be able to apply these same concepts for researching art to all different kinds of images that span well beyond our collection. Why research art in your classroom? So this very brief, just discussing the trajectory of our webinar series so far, in case you've had an opportunity to attend or watch the video for some of the prior ones this year, we started out focusing on how to read an image using visual literacy skills. Then we focused on how to talk about art using st strategies for discussion in your classroom. Today, we're taking that to the next level and looking at how you can delve deeper into a work of art using research to find out more. This diagram may be familiar to you. It's the diagram we use to break down how we think of reading an image. I'm not going to go into a great deal about it today, but you are welcome to watch the video of our prior webinars where we discuss this in depth. I'm also sharing some of the related curriculum standards for research. I'm sure many of you are already very knowledgeable about these. But I wanted to just let you know that we looked at the standards in putting together this webinar and made sure that we would connect closely with the standards that you're trying to cover in grades 6 through 12. So in terms of putting together the content for today, we wanted to share some of the guiding considerations. Um, for starters, we focused on research materials, sources for research that are widely accessible. I even tested several of these websites on a school district computer to make sure they would get through the firewalls of a public school district Chromebook. Additionally, we didn't want, we have access in a museum to um, research files from curatorial departments, but we realized that those are very inaccessible. So we didn't want to draw from that kind of research in modeling for you how you might look look for information about works of art. So we've really focused today on online sources that are easy to access. Additionally, we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've featured works of art from the Getty Museums collection, um, which can illustrate all the kinds of research approaches that we envision, but we hope that you can pull from museums where you live, um, in areas, in types of art, in cultural areas that you're interested in studying with your class and use these same approaches for all different types of collections. We've also tried to pick works of art that we think will be relatable for students. So today we're going to be focusing on four lenses for researching a work of art. As we get into the webinar, you'll notice that these overlap. They're not mutually exclusive, but we find that starting with these lenses is a helpful way to think about what to focus on when you guide your students in doing research. So the four lenses that we've focused on today are the artist point of view, the cultural and historical context for the work of art, symbolism, and the narrative lens. There's more. I'm sure when you start thinking about this yourself, you'll come up with others that we left out. But for the purposes of today, we wanted to go deeply into these four. So to get us started, Darcy will be delving into the artist's point of view approach to researching a work of art. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. So the first lens that we will use to research a work of art is um, all about exploring the intentions, experiences, and perspective of the artist. 
So this is a piece from the Getty Collection. And we'll be researching a work of art with the point of view of the artist in mind. And I think it'll help us to think about um, the artist and where the and the people in the work and the creation of the work um, that you might not think of otherwise. So through this exploration, we can also practice empathy with students and help them to think outside of themselves. Some of the questions to consider um, when using the artist's point of view to research a work of art um, might be, uh, you might consider asking um, like who made it, uh, you know, you can not, not only ask the who, what, why, um, but you could also consider how the artist's perspectives are impacted by the time, place, and culture it was made. So we can also compare the work of art with other works of art made by the same artist or other contemporaries of the time, or even other depictions of the same subject. So today I'm gonna to invite you to join me as I go through a process of finding some of the answers to some of these questions um, with a few steps using familiar strategies that you more than likely already use with your students. So let's say we don't know anything about this piece. A good place to start is to look at, a, at the basic information about that object. For example, the gallery label has a lot of information we can gather. Um, but when I look at this label, I have a lot more questions. So to begin the research process, you could have students generate a list of questions about what they find on the label. So questions like, what is the translation of the title? Where is Wuchitan, Oaxaca? Why is the artist, why was the artist at this location? Um, who is Graciela Iturbide? And why did they decide to take this photograph? And why does this lady have iguanas on her head? So once you sort of generate a list, you could start trying to find answers. So the next step, you could take search terms from your questions. So I've highlighted some of them here. So um, search term, my search terms are Wuchitan Oaxaca, Nuestra Señora de la Iguanas, and Graciela Iturbide. Um, you could have students look up where Wuchitan is on a map to see where it is in relation to where they are. Uh, perhaps, or you know, some of your students can share any knowledge they might have about that location. Some of them may have been there um, or know of it. Uh, to find out more about Graciela Iturbide, a good place to start is to see if there is an artist bio page on a museum website. So getty.edu has a hyperlink for the, um, to the artist bio from the collection page. So I was able to get to this um, short bio about Graciela. Um, from this bio, I found out that Graciela Iturbite was an artist who grew up in a home with a large family. She was the eldest of 13 children and eventually connected with and became a mentee of a famous photographer, Manuel Alvarez Bravo. And he was a master at capturing culture in areas of, in Mexican cities like Mexico, like Mexico City. Um, Bravo encouraged Graciela to explore pre-Hispanic Mexico and the ancient customs that prevailed in modern cities in Mexico. So next, um, you know, after learning more about perhaps what inspired Iturbide, we can go to our next term, which was that uh, title. So I use Google Translate to see what the title means. Um, and I also like how you can play the audio to hear the pronunciation of that term. So Nuestra Señora de la Iguanas translates to Our Lady of the Iguanas. So in this translation, what stuck out to me is the use of Our Lady terminologies um, and how that translates to English. So I decided to look into this a little bit more. So I started on Wikipedia because I like how Wikipedia combines a lot of things together, um, but obviously it's not the end all be all. For me, I use it as a jumping off point. Um, I also used, uh, I started looking at Our Lady in Google search 
to see what auto completed search terms there were. Um, there are algorithms that take, uh, you know, that come into play with this, but it could give you an idea of some popular, popularly searched terms just to see what comes up. Um, so you can see here on this top right that there are several names that come up, many that seem to relate to the church. Um, so it, it, there might be something more there to explore. And then as far as Wikipedia, um, the top hit reveals that Our Lady often refers to Mary of the Catholic Church. But there were also some other references to icons, shrines, and apparitions. Um, I see that Our Lady of Guadalupe is a Marian shrine from the medieval kingdom. So I think at this point we can see that there is possibly some significance to the choice of naming this photograph to include the term Our Lady. But I wonder if we could look at more depictions of Mary, um, what we would find there, and we're going to do that a little bit later. So Investigating the choices that Eder Bide made while making this work can uncover even more about the piece. Another great resource that the Getty has on this piece is a YouTube video about Eder Bide's legacy. In the video, we learn that Eder Bide chose to capture people in a real life way, doing things that they would already be doing. So she didn't set up scenes, she really wanted to capture what uh, the culture of people was doing in the areas where she visited. Um, and she also made, and Ether Bide also made choices on which images to present as the final photograph. So you can see here in this screenshot of the video, Ether Bide captured many images with different expressions, but she chose to depict Our Lady of the Iguanas as a strong and determined uh, maybe saint-like woman. Um, all the choices Eder Bide made mixed with the time and place of the artist contribute to the meaning that each of us may uncover while researching this work. Um, so I'm sure your students will find many other connections and have several other thoughts that may come into mind. Um, for me, I really enjoyed seeing, you know, all of these different images of, of the lady with the iguanas on her head and how some of them were really funny. Um, and I think, you know, the, the choice that Eder Bide made really, uh, makes a specific message about what she wanted to say about this person. So now that we've really explored the title and explored the choices that Eder Bide made, um, we can contextualize the time and place of the artist and when this photograph was made. So when I started looking at the year and place, I learned that Oaxaca, which was 1979, I learned that Oaxaca was um, in the early days of having new infrastructure like new highways and dams that contributed to the growth of some of the urban centers. Um, the pre-Hispanic culture that prevailed over time is where the interest of Graciela Iturbide lied and she had a desire to document communities in the growing city. Uh, she wanted to continue the work of some of her predecessors and post-revolutionary artists who were documenting the same communities in the decades before her. So I did, uh, something else you can do to dig deeper is compare this work of art with another one. Um, and so one way to further contextualize it is I could compare it depicting uh, something, two things of the same subject. So I found this painting of the Virgin Mary um, and I'm seeing some similarities. So there's some similar expressions on their faces. The cropping of their portraits is very similar. The proportions of how they are in the frame is also very similar. And it may be a little bit hard to see, but Mary does have a faint halo around her head. And that has, the same effects as the sort of fanned out arrangement of iguanas on the woman in Eder Bide's portrait. Um, from this comparison, we can see that there was definitely a similar treatment to the presentation of Our Lady with iguanas to the depictions of Mary as an icon during the Middle Ages. And this suggests that Nuestra Señora de la Iguanas is presented as a woman who is revered and important. 
And finally, I do want to share a few more works of art from our collection that connect to curriculum and perhaps have some interesting aspects to research through the artist's point of view lens. Miss Lala and the Fernando Circus is one of many drawings that Edgar Degas created while watching the famous cir circus performer spin and hang from her teeth in the air. There are some great themes to explore in this piece through the artist's point of view lens. Um, another piece that you could explore is Irises by Vincent Van Gogh. This painting was also part of a series of drawings that Van Gogh created from a mental health institution. And there are some interest, and there is some uh, interesting research around the choices and intentions of this work. So now I'm going to pass it to Rebecca to share another lens. Thanks, Darcy. Okay, so our next lens for today is the cultural and historical context. And the example that I've chosen for us to look at today focuses more on the historical context, but there are several other examples you could try using that focus a little bit more on the cultural element of context. So our objective in using this lens is to focus on really the context that an image came from. And for the example that I'll be using today, I'm using a photograph that was taken by photographer Bruce Davidson um, called March from Selma, Selma, Alabama. So some of the guiding questions that you can use when you're using this lens to research a work of art include questions like, what does this image represent? When and why was it made? What did it mean when it was made? What does it tell us about the culture or the time that is represented? What else was happening during the time that it was made? And I'm sure you can think of others as well. So for this image, let's start by looking at the question, what does the image represent? To give us some baseline information to delve deeper. So as Darcy did, I pulled the caption for this image off of the Getty website. This is an image in the Getty's collection. Uh, and so I pulled the, the basic information that we include on the object page. And some of the focused questions that I'm going to ask today with this photograph are who is pictured, what are they doing, where was this photo taken, and are there multiple points of view to consider? I also like to point out when you're doing research on the internet, Sometimes you find things that aren't relevant to what you're looking for. And I think it's equally important with your students to talk about that and to talk about why something is relevant or not relevant and to look at the sources um, that they're pulling from. Um, for example, in researching the March from Selma, there's a lot of information and some comes from more reputable organizations and some is more journalist, well, not journalistic, but more like written by individuals that don't have an institutional affiliation that may or may not um, be rooted in an editorial process or a research process. So it's worth um, having those conversations with your students when you're researching real life events um, that have kind of different types of news treatments. So for this image, uh, the starting place I would usually go to is the collections page on the Getty Museum's website, or if it's in a work of art from another museum, I might check their collections page. But the, the collections page that we have at our museum doesn't have a lot of information beyond this information that I've put in the box. So I needed to look elsewhere for this today. So I started searching on terms like March from Selma, and Selma, Alabama. And I found a lot of articles in historic archives like the National Archives website talking about the Selma marches. So going back to my questions, who's pictured? So what I learned is that this was a photograph that depicted one of the marches from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. The people pictured are some of the protesters that were involved in the march that what they're doing is protesting. And when I read more about what they're protesting, what I learned is that they were protesting the challenge that African-Americans were facing in registering to vote in Selma at the time in 1965. Uh, 
We'll talk more about different points of view as we delve further into this. Okay, so then I wanted to find out even more. And I wanted to use multiple sources. I haven't represented them all here, but I pulled more information about the, there was more than one March. There were several marches in the month of March, <laughs> marches in March. Um, and they all went from Sel Selma to Montgomery, which was the capital, to demonstrate the challenge of registering to vote and to protest against it. So why did the young man have vote written across his forehead? Because he was trying to demonstrate the importance of voting and the desire to be able to vote. So then there's the question of what were some of the outcomes of the marches? So, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily, uh, but the, the main outcome was the eventual, eventual passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So I also wanted to consider a little bit more about who is Bruce Davidson and why did he take this photograph? And Bruce Davidson is still alive today. And so he's very active in res responding to journalists. Um, there are articles about him that you can find and lots of quotes that um, include his point of view about the types of work that he's doing and why he's doing it. So we have the advantage with a living photographer that we can access a lot, of, lot more information than we can from photographers who lived long ago who may have less documentation associated with their work. So I pulled um, a biography about Bruce Davidson from the International Center for Photography. I learned a little bit about his life and how he got interested in taking photographs. He had been exposed to a camera when he was very young and then um, later joined the military and was asked to photograph on behalf of the military and then later became interested in very real life gritty subjects. Here's a quote from him. He said, I made a decision early on not to buy a telephoto lens to never be more than a meter and a half from the protesters and the policemen I was photographing on the streets. I wanted to be almost in the picture. So that tells you a little bit about his point of view and what he was trying to capture. He also talks a lot about wanting to see and using photography, not as much as a political act, but as an act of seeing. So then you can also dig deeper. So, for example, there are because it's in 1965, we have access to eyewitness accounts of the marches from Selma to Montgomery. So I pulled one example here, uh, but this is a great research project to build on for your students, which is to look for more articles about this time and what was going on and to hear points of view from different people who lived at that time, both from the people who were trying to restrict access to voting and those who were arguing for more voter rights. There's also a speech that you can find from Martin Luther King Jr. on YouTube in, in which he spoke to all the protesters when they reached Montgomery to talk about their struggle and what they were hoping to achieve. You can also map it. So the National Park Service has a historic trail that they have marked. They've um, created an article where they talk about all the different spots along the way, um, especially important spots where um, protests happen, where there were acts of violence that happened, trying to stop the protest. Uh, and so one activity to dig deeper is to start looking at geographically where the protesters would have traveled. There's also a lot of other documentation of this part of the civil rights march between Selma and Montgomery. The Library of Congress is one of the best sites to search for this kind of material. Um, I've given you a sense, a quick screenshot of a search. If you look in the upper left corner of the screenshot, it's very small, but you'll see that there's 82 results in this search. Um, I searched March on the term March from Selma, 1965. So there's a lot that you can find to support your research and to find out more about what was going on at that time and to compare with the image that Davidson took. 
you can also delve into the outcomes of these protests by researching what happened at the end. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the protests eventually culminated in the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And um, the American Presidency Project includes the address that the president gave at the time at the signing of the Voting Rights Act. So you can also learn more about the historical context by delving into this aspect of the history, which is what came afterwards. So you can use a similar process as the one that I've just demonstrated to explore a lot of different types of works of art. So for a point of contrast, I included here a tapestry, a French tapestry that depicts the interactions between Jesuit missionaries and the Chinese emperor in the study of astronomy. This kind of work of art includes a lot of interesting uh, historical research that you can find, such as the journals of the Jesuit missionaries and the stories that they told about their interactions when they were traveling in China. Another example of a work of art that you could use for this type of research is this image by Dorothea Lange. Dorothea Lange was well known for having documented the drought and the dust bowl in America in the 1930s and captured here a family that had gone to try and you know, find their way and make a new life for themselves only to struggle because of drought and who had to leave eventually and look for a new life. Okay, so with that, we will move forward with the next lens, which is symbolism, and Darcy will be covering that. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, so this lens focuses on researching motifs, symbols, and symbolic imagery found in a work of art to learn more about its meaning and background. So by deciphering the symbolism of a work of art, we can learn the story about the people, places, and experiences you're seeing a theme here that surround the creation of this object and what it communicates. So the chandelier that I'm showing you now is in the Getty, Getty's Museum Collection of Decorative Arts. And we are gonna let the imagery and motifs found in the chandelier sort of drive the research process this time. So the guiding questions for this lens deal with what imagery you could find, what possible meanings there might be, are there multiple interpretations of those symbols, and what do those symbols tell us about the time and place? So the first step is to start looking. Uh, this chandelier has a lot of details that could be symbolic. Um, so what you could do is spend some time with your students, um, either zooming in on the image or, um, you know, maybe having your students pull up the image of the chandelier and start picking up some of the things that they see. Um, and then there's a lot of animals and creatures and flowers and even the whole shape of the chandelier um, could possibly be a familiar shape, maybe perhaps a hot air balloon. And then the next step is to make a more precise list of some of the symbols you see. Um, this could also be a good time to maybe have a conversation with your students about what symbolism is and what makes something symbolic. So I pulled up uh, the Oxford definition of symbolism and it, and, and it says it's the use of symbols to represent ideas or qualities. So for me, I think that there could be a very rich discussion with students about what makes a symbol. Um, there may be some ideas um, that could drive some debate on what counts as a symbol, what a symbol means. Um, and we'll find a little bit of that as we look into some of the symbols of this chandelier. So like, it, there's no way that we could go through all of the symbols today and the time we have, but I am going to explore a couple of these with you today. Um, it, as you look longer and longer, you start noticing more and more and more. Um, so we're going to go through and explore the meaning of a few. 
And one great resource for this work of art is the Google Arts and Culture page. The Getty has a whole page dedicated to this work of art and it outlines many of the motifs and symbols that we've listed already. Uh, one part of the chandelier that is focused on in the page is the gold griffin. Um, the upper uh, candle holders are part eagle and part lion. And this page, um, when I was reading it, it talks about how since antiquity, this myth mythical beat, these mythical beasts have been associated with guarding treasure and precious possessions. Um, I also wanted to use Google Arts and Culture in an, another way to sort of investigate the Griffin. Um, another thing you can do is utilize a feature in Google Arts and Culture that lets you do an image search using a search term. So when I search the term Griffin, as you can see on the bottom there, it brings up a bunch of works of art that use that have Griffins in them, and you can click on them to get information on those. So I I chose to check out this jug with a Griffin spout, and it's in the British Museum's collection. And when I read about it, I found out that the Griffin is an imaginary beast, first known in various forms in the Near East. And then it was adopted by the Greeks later on, and they changed the body um, to a lion and the beak to an eagle. Um, so this adds to that conversation about symbolism and meaning of imagery around the globe and how it can morph and change um, and how different cultures and times can have different um, reactions to symbols and what they mean. I also wanted to research the hot air balloon. Um, so this work of art could connect to science and history curriculum through the exploration of how hot air balloons work and their inventions. Um, again, I like using Wikipedia to sort of get a snapshot and then I move out from there. I just love the images of the different hot air balloons that I found on that page. So then when I dug deeper, I found a lot of information about the first flight and the significance of the hot air balloon. Um, there was a lot of overlap in the history that I found about the first flight and um, some of the things that I found in the chandelier. So for example, the balloon was decorated in gold, zodiac signs, and the sun, which symbolized the French monarch King Louis to the community at the time. And the Smithsonian also had a great article about how traveling in a hot air balloon was thought to be the future of air travel and symbolized luxury and designers were um, making plans for these elaborate airships because they were the future of luxury travel. Um, and then all of this research can be circled back to the chandelier and how the use of certain imagery and materials can perhaps tell a story about the specific time and place that the object was made. So we also have other works in the Getty collection that you could use to explore uh, symbolism. So this sculpture is an allegorical portrait of the Van Rissenberg family and depicts members of the family as characters in ancient mythology. So Madame Van Rissenberg is portrayed as Minerva, the goddess of, goddess of wisdom and war, and she's raising her shield over her young son. And we know that this is Minerva because some of the um, uh, animals and the clothing and things that, that they're wearing. So. Um, that could be a good exercise with your students. And then another option, I put the tapestry that Rebecca shared already, um, but there is a lot of objects and symbols that um, perhaps you could follow and see how ideas were shared across the globe. So now I'm gonna pass it back over to Rebecca. Thanks, Darcy. Okay, so we're going to talk about the narrative lens. And the narrative lens can focus on either a fiction or nonfiction narrative. Um, for today's example, we're going to focus on a fictional lens. 
we wanted to make sure that we included an object from antiquity uh, since we have a lot of teachers who like to use our Greek and Roman art collection in their classrooms. So for this work of art, a hydria, um, we're gonna focus on the questions that you would typically cover in an English language arts cu curriculum associated with narrative. So who might be the main characters? What, what is the action? What looks like the plot? Is there a setting that's visible? Um, are you familiar with stories like this? Does this ring a bell, the story? Um, are there perspectives that are not being told in the story? And most importantly, are there visual clues in this work of art that help to tell us what that story is? So we're going to take a few minutes to um, pull apart some of the details that we see here. So I started by just creating a list of some of the details that I thought might have to do with the story. So I saw, well, there's a creature with nine snake heads. There are two human-like figures that are battling the creature. There are a bunch of decorative details like leafy designs and star-like designs up around the neck of the vase. And it has handles and it's painted. So on our website, I was also able to pull more detail images to focus in on other um, views of this vase. So here's one where I'm also able to see the detail of a crab that looks like it's touching or pinching the heel of one of the figures. I'm also able to get a better look at the club that's being held by one of these figures. And I'm noticing on the snakes that there's something that looks like a beard hanging from their chin. So then I wanted to research what the story might be. In this case, uh, the collections page that we have at the Getty Museum for this Hydria tells a good version of the story in short, but with enough detail to be able to start the research process. So what I was able to find out is that the figure on the right is Heracles. Um, that the figure on the left is his nephew and the creature that they're fighting is this um, it's called a hydra and it's a kind of a monster with um, nine snake heads that can regenerate. One of them can regenerate if you try and remove it. So I also searched around further on our website and found this teacher resource that actually tells the story of the 12 labors of Heracles. Um, so I pulled kind of a general version and these are short student facing versions of the story. They're not very heavy in text, um, but if you wanted to take it to the next level, we I'm also gonna show you some sources that look a little bit more in detail at these stories. So this, the 12 labors of Heracles, most of you are likely familiar with it, uh, this story, and there are several different versions of it. And the story, the version that we tell here, um, Heracles was driven mad by Hera, who was, un, who was unhappy that he had been born because her husband Zeus had, um, had um, produced Heracles in his union with a mortal woman, which made Hera jealous and mad. And so she punished Heracles by basically driving him mad such that he, caught, he, caught, he was caused to kill his wife and children. He then needed to, to um, kind of fulfill a sentence for having done this terrible thing and was sentenced to uh, undertaking these 12 labors. So this piece of this handout goes into greater detail about the labor that's pictured in, on this face. Again, it's a more simple version. Um, we see this this hydra, this monster that came from a place called Lerna. Um, and it shows Heracles with his nephew, Aeolaus, who, um, who are trying to remove the heads. They don't necessarily succeed because the heads can regenerate. So, but they're able to cauterize the wound, preventing the heads from regenerating by heating their sickle with a flame. 
you don't see the flame in this drawing. And the vase is, um, does have a flame underneath Heracles's nephew, but it's a little bit hard to see. So with mythology, as with many stories, there are a lot of different versions of the stories because they've been told and passed down by many people over time. So for students who are interested in going deeper, um, there are a lot of places that they can look to find other versions of the labors of Heracles. When I started talking about this story with my son, he was like, no, 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 the version on Wikipedia is different. <laughs> So, so, and then he, he proceeded to tell me about different sources and how they tell different versions of the story. So that's also an interesting exercise to do with students, which is to explore how stories grow and change over time. Um, I pulled as an example for you, um, a page from the Perseus Project at Tufts University, which is a great um, compendium of this, the labors of Hercules and the related stories, but also has other information related to Greek, Greek mythology and other characters that were in the pantheon that um, are part of these stories, people like Hera. So it's also possible to look more into the characters depicted in the stories by finding other representations of them. So here's a statue of Heracles, um, and you can see some of the details that, uh, that build on the, the 12 labors that he had to complete. So you see him holding in his right hand, it's on our left, um, the lion skin, which he got from the Nimean lion, which was in the first labor of Hercules. Similarly, we see him holding his club, the same club that we saw in the original vase. So I'm gonna go back to that vase so we can get a closer look at it. So here you can see the club that he's holding. And let's go back one more. Here on below Iolaus's legs, you can see the flame that he was using to cauterize the cut off snake heads. Additionally, the crab is a monster that was kind of on the same team as the Hydra and was helping to fend off Her Her Heracles by pinching at his heel, although it didn't work. Heracles eventually just knocked him with his glove and kept fighting the Hydra and eventually won. And then once he completed that labor, he went on to the third labor. The other thing that you can do is look at other representations of the same story. So in this case, I've pulled another work of art that has similar characters depicted, a similar action. Um, and here's a close up so you can get a better look. So here we see in this case, Heracles is on the left. And one way to know that is to see what's on his head, which is a version of that lion skin. You can also see Iolaus with the torch in this case. So instead of having a sickle with a fire below him, he's holding a torch, which he's using. And you can see in his right hand kind of obscured by the snake heads. You can see him kind of getting ready to cauterize those snake heads. Another very noticeable difference in this case is it's showing the regenerated heads. So instead of just nine heads, it's showing how more heads regenerate as they were trying to cut them off to kill this creature. So this can be a fun activity for students in dissecting a narrative is to look at different ways the story has been told and different ways of representing different aspects of the story. So I also wanted to dig deeper and find out about, well, what is a hydria? So the object information calls this a hydria. Um, and this is in contrast to Hydra, which is the name of that nine headed monster. So a Hydria is a large water vessel. And I used Britannica as my place to find that information. So then I also thought about other types of works of art that you could use to use this approach to researching a narrative. 
So certainly delving into mythology is one approach that you can use because there's a lot of art that represents that history, especially useful if you're a middle school teacher and covering this uh, particularly in your sixth grade classroom. So here's a less ancient set of statues by Joseph Nollikins, which is telling the story of the judgment of Paris. Another type of work of art that you could use is kind of what I would call historical fiction. So this is a painting by Joseph Turner, and it explores a naval exercise of a potentially real person named Von Trump. It's not entirely certain whether um, this was this um, version of the story was based in fact or whether it was semi-factual and based on Turner's envisioning of the kind of romantic notion of these seamen battling the very rambunctious waves. So, but as you can see, there's a variety of different types of images and narratives that you can explore using this approach. Okay, so we'd like to put it all together for you very briefly before we move on to a Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask Darcy to come on back and pass I'm the back. mic to her. <laughs> Unmuted. All right, thank you, Rebecca. All right, so putting it all together. So now let's go over some ways um, that your students can sort of either do, um, you know, to verify to you that they've been doing the research, but perhaps do it in a fun way. Um, we've done all this research together through some various lenses, um, but we did want to share some ideas that students can document their research and share some of the sources that they found along the way. So one idea is you could use maps and geography to document findings. So maybe students map where symbols originated from, or you know, we talked about earlier how the griffin morphed and changed as it, as it made its way from the Near East into Western uh, culture. So perhaps you could choose a symbol to, to map out or maybe map out the journey of the artist. So maybe they find out where Graciela Iturbide traveled and where some of the photographs that she took were from in Mexico or other places. Um, and then, or you could simply, you know, map places and that are depicted in an image or where images were taken. Uh, you could also have your students curate a collection of works that share the same theme or tell a story. So maybe they could tell the story of the travels of a hot air balloon or, um, like I said earlier, about the Griffins and the art history of that. Um, maybe you have a collection of different Griffins that you use um, or that they could use. Um, and then students can also make a slideshow or other type of presentation where they've documented all of the sources and images, much like what we did today with you. Um, and then your students can also write reflections on the work of art. What were they curious about? What did they learn? Was there anything that surprised them? Um, you know, is there anything that they wanna research more about? Um, or maybe they could write an annotated bibliography for a work of art and document what sources they discovered and maybe a little paragraph about what, what the, why that source helped them sort of uncover more information. Um, and then you could uh, utilize small groups um, or a whole group and maybe everybody sort of makes a huge wall size collage of all of the findings, um, maybe do some printouts or some drawings, um, and they could sort of make like a wall size scrapbook of everything that they found about a work of art. Um, there are many, many more ideas out there, and I'm sure that you all have them, so I encourage you to explore them. Um, and 
the last thing I do want to share with you um, is this is a very short list. There were more in this presentation, um, but these are some of the online sources that we used. And I know Rebecca mentioned this earlier, but depending on the limitations of technology, firewalls and all that stuff, I'm sure that all of you have a lot of sources that you um, are familiar with. I just wanted to put a few down that we used today. And I think we're now ready for the Q&A. Or I think Rebecca's wrapping up and then we're going into the Q&A. OK, so as we, we've we talked about um, this, uh, our series of webinars, we've, we've talked about how to read an image, how to talk about art, how to research art. And I wanted to give you a little plug for our next series, our next set of webinars, which are focused on creating art and using the creative process to express oneself. So taking everything that students will have learned about using visual literacy skills to read an image, using visual, visual literacy and, and dialogue based skills to talk about a work of art, um, learning to research a work of art and find greater detail and really delve into what it's all about and to take all of that learning about how artists have expressed themselves through the works of art that they've looked at and to take that approach to creating their own images for self-expression so in march for grades um, K through five and in April for grades six through 12 we'll be exploring how to take how to bring together these skills and use them for students to express themselves. So uh, last but not least, as Darcy mentioned, we have the Q and A. Um, I did see one question in the Q and A. So I'm going to go ahead and answer that. We had a question from one of our participants about how do you decide if information is um, good information? She asks, do you try and obtain at least two verifications of info on the artist or more sources? So what I would say about that is that it depends on the source. Um, so in some cases, it's wonderful if students can find more than one um, source of information and to triangulate and find um, similar information. But we also know that there's a tendency for one source to pick up information from another source. So just because one piece of information is repeating doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best information. Um, and we find that that's the case more and more as uh, like independent writers like bloggers are doing their own research, pulling from sources, and then um kind of adding to it and restating some of what they've learned so what we would recommend is really to focus on the nature of the institution that you're looking at and we've even done that in this webinar because when we looked at what you might find when you're searching for these things there are a lot of sources that we didn't include because we were less certain about their credibility so we tried to focus on organizations that are academic in nature that are research oriented other museums organizations like the library of congress and the national archives and and that's not to say that there aren't mistakes i mean we've had found mistakes on our own website every now and then so you know it's possible that there are errors um nevertheless um or and what's more information changes as research continues sometimes we think we know one thing and then we research it more and find something else so um but yes it's good to think not just to look for multiple sources but rather to focus more on the type of source and how that source is generating its information are they looking at archives are they looking into primary sources how are they finding out what it is that they know um so let's see if there are any other questions uh okay so i love this question so one other question was the teacher does have to do a lot of research to make sure that she he or she can answer the student questions with a sample project. So I love this question. It comes up in a lot of forms in our webinars. The question of um, how much do we need to know to be able to talk about works of art? 
And we really like to encourage you to not feel like you have to know that much. Right. It's very fine to be transparent in, especially when you're researching a work of art, to show that research that you're doing to the students as you're doing it. And so in a sense, you're not just handing them the fish, but you're teaching the fish, you know, teaching them how to fish by showing them how you are going about coming up with an answer. Um, I don't know, Darcy, do you, do you have anything to yeah. add to that? Yeah, and I, I want to add too that when we make these webinars, you know, one of the goals of this one was to sort of give you more information about the work of art um, as we were going along. So that way you have at least a couple of works of art that you've heard us talk about that perhaps, you know, might come up when you're working with your students. Um, so that way it's sort of gives you, you know, you don't, we, we would like to, you to take advantage of the work that we've done for you so that you don't have to feel like you need to know everything um, about it. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, let's find out, you know, it's really a, a powerful tool when it comes to a work of art. And I think it also works well because sometimes there's multiple interpretations and, um, you know, there's not always a concrete answer like there is in other subject areas you know sometimes there's a lot of ambiguity um, in things that you see and so there, there's a lot of pressure sometimes to yes know all the answers but don't feel like you need to because the nature of art is that there can be a lot of ambiguity and there's value in thinking through that ambiguity and not necessarily just you know knowing us giving you the answers to everything Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again at a future webinar. Uh, I'll share with you very briefly our upcoming dates. I'll put them up on the screen and I'll leave them up as I say goodbye for anybody who would like to write down those dates and have them for future reference. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. We hope to see you again soon.